God be with you. Good morning again. I, I have been falsely accused of scolding you. So I need you all to just agree that I did not scold you yesterday. <laughs> well, I scolded you, but that was, you're different. <laughs> uh, welcome back. Uh, yesterday was good, yes? Amen. And uh, we are looking forward to today. Um, I told you he was engaging. I, I forgot to tell you he was snarky funny, uh, but you figured that out for yourself. And so that's good. Uh, please join me again in welcoming Dr. Wes Allen back to kind of keep us in this conversation about Marcus' parable. Now, I didn't introduce myself, and I made quite an assumption that you knew I was, I was the dean and vice president of academic affairs. So in case you missed that, I am the dean. My name is Valerie Bridgman. I also teach preaching, which is how we know one another so well, and Hebrew Bible, among other things. So back to what I was saying about funny and snarky, here he is. Thank you. I don't know what she's talking about. <laughs> I have respect for every human being I know, except for those from Childersburg. So that's... I do want to thank you for yesterday. Um, I know when you come to these things, um, one of the great benefits is to catch up with people. And um, you could have been spending more time attending to each other than to me. And it was a, it was a very nice day for me. Just to remind you sort of where, where we are and what we did yesterday. Um, we started off yesterday trying, uh, working through Mark and reading Mark as a parable. And then we did our workshop where we looked at the, the multivalence uh, kind of character of parables and how do you preach parables in general. So today we're now shifting from those categories to preaching Mark as a parable. So reading Mark as a parable yesterday and how, how do we preach Mark as a parable. My goal for the lecture time is to, to focus on how we might bring out parabolic themes from Matthew into the pulpit. And then the workshop, we're going to focus on some strategies for thinking about sequential sermons, if you will. Um, so what I want to do first is show why this is a problem at all. Why preaching Mark as a parable is, is, is a difficult thing to do. Um, I'm going to frame the conversation by looking at the history of narrative criticism as a biblical tool and then the history of approaches to narrative preaching and homiletics. Um, so we start all the way back with medieval exegesis, because why not? Um, we often think that literalist readings have dominated the history of Christianity, but it's just not true. So back in the medieval time, this, this fourfold reading was created. Um, the, the poem down here at the bottom reads better in Latin, I presume, than it does in English. But it, it's interesting that it just so happens that it rhymes in English. Um, but there was the literal reading, which assumed... Um, the text said, referred to history, an allegorical reading, which uh, made it a doctrinal kind of uh, teaching tool, a moral reading, ethical, so a behavioristic reading of the text, and then an anagogical, which said something about life after death, uh, so individual eschatology in this sense. So you could read a text in any of those four ways, and that would make its way into the pulpit as well. Comes the, uh, the, the Reformation, and with the Reformation comes the emphasis on Scripture as the sole determiner of faith. So Scripture is not to be read through the lens of the church's tradition. Uh, it should be flipped, the Reformers said. So you read the text for what the text says. A basic assumption was that the literal plain sense matched the, the basic historical reality behind the text. 
Uh, that doesn't mean there was no appreciation for figurative language in the text. It wasn't that everything had to be taken literally, but it was assumed generally that the plain sense of the text was what should, should be preached. So at this point, preaching becomes exposition, sort of commentary, which also predates this time as well. So you get this sort of um, mixture of um, a, a sort of rejection of the medieval exegesis without it all being gone away into this. We get to the rise of historical criticism and that assumption that there is a correlation between the plain sense of the text and the history behind it is challenged. The writings of the Bible were seen uh, to be expressions of faith that may or may not accord with historical events. And so investigation into where those things matched um, came up, and so a scientific worldview at this point, biblical criticism is called a scientific endeavor. Biblical scholars sought to be objective and, and try and distance themselves from it and study it the way you would study something in the laboratory. Now, this meant there was an adjustment to the authority of Scripture and a challenge to the way people preached. Because if you no longer could assume that the text spoke history, and we're in a post-Darwin day, and these other, then, then what do you preach? So do you only preach those texts that scholars say, now this is historical, if that's not, so we preach this one, not that one. Or do you preach story and not worry about history? It's a confusing day. And um, so for the great um, uh, inheritance we have from historical criticism, it didn't filter into preaching nearly as well as it could have. Um, this is when the rise, though, of liberal theological traditions came up, and they tried, those traditions tried to answer the question in some ways, and try, and, and by liberal, you gotta remember what we mean in this day is the liberating from the superstitions of the past, in a sense. So, how do we read the text in a way that liberates us from the superstitions of the past, but don't lose the, 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 way to, the theological weight of the text. So take the creation story, for instance. Once Darwin becomes accepted, you have two options. One is to argue against Darwin and assume the historicity of Genesis 1 and through 3, and that, that the world was created in six days, and you count those genealogies back, and it was 6,000 years ago. Or, you, well, I guess there's really three options. You could reject the text altogether and just avoid it. Or you could then say, okay, this offers a different kind of truth, a theological truth, and you start reading it in those ways. So a lot of um, changes happening in the authority of Scripture as it's viewed from the pulpit at this point. A key part of hist this historical exercise was, this in, related to the Gospels, was trying to separate the historical Jesus of Nazareth from the Christ of faith. So which texts speak history and which only speak theology? And notice that only speak theology, which would have been the way it would have been expressed. And I mentioned yesterday that numerous lives of Jesus were written in German scholarship through this time that worked through the Gospels, plucking out the historical kernels that different scholars thought were there, disbanding the part of the stories that didn't fit, so miracles went by the side, etc. You can see where deists like Thomas Jefferson came from and just, okay, I'm only going to take the stuff that fits with my worldview. Well, in 1906, Albert Schweitzer wrote in German but what we now call the quest for the historical Jesus. And he showed basically how each scholar turned Jesus into a reflection of their own theology. So put Jesus in a box that fits with what I think as a 19th, as an 18th and 19th century theologian. Schweitzer argued that Jesus, if you look at the gospel seriously, historically, appears to be a failed apocalyptic preacher. After all, his last cry is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And 19th century theologians just dismissed apocalypticism. And so Jesus looks more radically different. Well, Schweitzer's picture of the historical Jesus had some influence, but what really had influence was his critique of us subjectively making Jesus look like us.
And so in a sense, the search for historical Jesus just died away. It's, it's been resurrected a few times with different historical sensitivities and, and critical methodologies. But, but at the time, it just said we can't use the Gospels to get back to the historical Jesus. So what do you preach in the wake of that? If the history to which the Gospels refer can't be verified, where lies the authority of Scripture for the church, for the pulpit? So what are we supposed to preach? Well, to the rescue comes form criticism. It's not a great rescue, but it's a rescue. And um, we get scholars like De Martin DeBellius, Rudolf Bultmann, Vincent Taylor. And what they do is they draw on approaches for studying folk literature uh, and, and noticing the different ways genres are shaped and uh, the different ways they function. And the assumption is that the form of a pericope, of a passage, function differently in their original settings than they did in the gospel in which they were collected. So different genres had different functions. And this is where we get that great German phrase you remember from your New Testament and Old Testament classes, the Sitzenleben. The one German phrase you ought to hold on to, Sitzenleben, the setting in life of a particular story. So a miracle story, for instance, follows a basic stereotype flow. Um, the meeting of the person who is ill and the healer, um, some kind of healing action, proof of the healing, witnesses um, are amazed, that kind of thing. So sort of standard structure. You notice that and then you um, deduce what settings these would have been used in. So they highlight the power of the healer, and therefore these would have been used in evangelistic settings to try and convince people to become followers of Jesus. Or take a pronouncement story, which is basically a setup and a punchline, right? Jesus sees something, Jesus hears something, someone asks Jesus a question, someone attacks Jesus for something, and then Jesus gets the last word. We see those stories over and over and over again. These might have functioned more inside the church, to offer teaching to the people and how to respond to different things. So you can see how their thinking worked. Basically, what's happened is there's been a, a move from trying to get back to the historical Jesus, and now we're trying to get back to the historical church. Oh, we can't get all the way back to Jesus, but we can get to how the church used this language, and then that, that form criticism can inform the way we preach. So... Not back as far as we might like, but there's something to get back to. The problem, of course, is if getting back to the historical Jesus is conjecture, so is getting back to the earlier church. So this only takes preaching so far as a helpful tool. In the mid-20th century, into this chasm steps redaction criticism. Redaction critics said, okay, let's quit thinking about the gospel writers simply as collectors. They just collected this stuff and crammed it together and we separated out, said form critics. Redaction critics said, let's look at the whole. We want to um, value the evangelist as editors. They've not just collected this stuff, they shaped it in a certain way for certain theological purposes. So redaction critics are responsible for those synopses you had to buy when you were back in seminary. Before that, synopses have been used to harmonize the Gospels. Now, we really want to look at the differences, especially look at how Matthew and Luke reshaped Mark for their specific theological intentions. So what you do, th this was a, a great aid to preaching, actually. You could look at, say, a text from Matthew um, and see how he changed Mark, or scholars could say, Mark, where's things added in that looks like it's a kernel of older tradition? And you look at it and you say, okay, what did Mark intend for this? And that's a clue for then how you preach it. What Mark intended with this passage, what Luke intended with this passage, that's what I should intend with my sermon. So if you can't get back to the historical Jesus, and you can't get back to the historical church, at least we have the author. Right? Well. <laughs> While these kinds of conversations were happening in the religion department at universities, across the hall in English departments, it's pretty much the same time, 
Literary critics were talking about the intentional fallacy. And what they were arguing, they weren't arguing about Bible, they were just arguing about any piece of literature. They argued that the idea of knowing what an author or a painter or a poet intended for their creation, um, they argued that that shouldn't really be helpful at all to us interpreting what that art piece of art means and does. So there's really sort of two sides to this. On the one hand, these literary critics said, Determining what an author intended is really conjecture in the first place. The same argument we had about the historical Jesus, the historical early church. We're making up what Charles Dickens must have meant from the text because Dickens didn't tell us. On the other hand, the second piece is that some would say later, who cares what the author intends? There may be stuff in the text uh, in the art piece that the author never even thought about and we, the, the audience, find and realize and we can make meaning of that. There's a great uh, precursor to this kind of critique. Edgar Allan Poe uh, wrote The Raven, one of the greatest poems in American um, history, literature. And later he wrote an essay describing the creative process by which he came up with that poem, and in the midst of it, interpreting what it meant. Not long after that essay appeared, a literary critic wrote an essay saying, Poe is wrong about how he created this poem, <laughs> and he's wrong about what it means. Well, New Testament critics begin to embrace this literary approach um, to studying scripture. Um, treating it the way you would treat any piece of fiction. That's not necessarily calling it fictional, as if there's no truth there, but reading it using the same tools you would. Um, so we get this early book on literary criticism, um, but I'm especially interested in The Genesis of Secrecy by Frank Kermode, who um, in a lecture at Harvard interpreted Mark um, in, uh, as a piece of literature, and Kermode was not a biblical scholar at all. He was a literary critic, and he brings all those tools, and this is part of this shift from Mark hiding in the shadows, especially of Matthew, but also of Luke, and it's starting to rise up, and people have a lot of interest in it. So what's happening is the Bible department is starting to embrace literary ways of study. So if you can't get back to the historical Jesus, the historical church, or even the historical author, well, we got the text, at least. We're just going to deal with the text. Now, I want to say that um, all this going on, we need to recognize that our midst is one who was a part of this early movement, Bob Tannehill. And I just want to say what I said to him. is These two works were incredibly influential on me. I wrote my dissertation on Luke Acts. And um, he, he was one of these people who was uh, at the, the beginning of really pushing this kind of uh, literary critique on it. So how many of you here as alums had a chance to be in class with Bob? I hate you all. I'm so jealous. <laughs> and I'm so honored that you're here. So let's, let's thank him for this movement. <laughs> Now, I, I want to name that there's been a great deal of movement in gospel interpretation, of course, since this started rising in the 1970s. There's been uh, um, more and more sophistication to the kind of literary criticism that's brought in. But there's also been other methodologies that have been used. Uh, reader-oriented criticism, reader-response criticism, ideological interpretation, so we get feminist, ethnic, womanist kinds of readings, etc., uh, ecological readings, postmodern interpretation and postcolonial interpretations. None of these, in my opinion, counter this, but they really do add some different layers of things. So it's not a rejection of this. But so starting in the 70s, we start appreciating the Gospels as narratives. One thing you might be interested to know, however, is that no commentary until recently, one, has really been written on Mark at, purely from uh, a, a narrative perspective, the way um, Bob did with, with Luke Acts here. Um, there's been one out there, and um, but here's the real problem is we preachers haven't known what to do with that stuff. So I want to back up 
and run a parallel chart on the history of preaching timeline for a sentence, uh, just, just a glance, but we don't have to go all the way back. We can actually start in the uh, late 1800s. Um, John Broadus in 1870 wrote an intro to preaching textbook that's gone through three different major revisions. Actually, there's a fourth one in there that was small. John Broadus was at Louisville um, at Southern Baptist. And um, this was the textbook in preaching for the first half of the 20th century. It was used everywhere. Its roots really traced back to the classical Greek rhetoric tradition and the university style sermon um, that came into play in the 14th century. So really, we're talking about he sort of writes it based on what's been done. And what that means is that the, the university sermon of medieval um, times was, was one that said a, a sermon should have a theme and then be broken in to smaller themes. The, the three-point sermon basically comes from this. Now, uh, this was by Robert of Bassivorn, and Robert uh, did not say that for this form to be complete, you need a poem and a joke. <laughs> but he actually did have a section on um, humor, timely humor, that was appropriate in this form. So actually, even that goes back to a ways. So what Broadus basically does is teach us how to build propositional sermons, deductive propositional sermons. So tell them what you're going to tell them in a big way, break it into parts, and your, your purpose is to be persuasive. You want to persuade people that your argument is sound. And then, of course, he deals with how to deliver this argument orally. Now, we should say that this method of preaching is no longer dominant in the pulpit, but it's still around. After all, the last version of this was revised in 1979. You can still find it on Amazon in print. Um, but really, it's been replaced by the evangelical scholar Haddon Robinson, who died just a couple years ago. And um, he argued that preachers need to preach out of a big idea. Hear the proposition. You have a big idea that focuses the sermon and you unfold it in that way. So we certainly still hear this kind of preaching around, but, but it's, not, um, it's, it's not as influential as once was, partly because of this book in the late 1950s. The first major chink in the armor of propositional kinds of preaching came from H. Grady Davis. And what David, and by the way, this book, even though it's from the 50s, is still very much worth reading, in my opinion. Um, he argues against imposing a static form on all sermons and instead says there should be an organic relationship between the substance of the sermon and the form of the sermon. Now, that just seems like it's obvious to us that that should happen. What you're trying to say and how you say it should mesh. But you got to remember, this was really radically new in 1958. You could go from place to place to place, and you could hear sermons that were very much similar, regardless of what the text was, regardless of what the message was. The form of the sermons would be the same. So this is the beginning of thinking about sermonic form in relation to the effect the preacher wants it to have on the hearers. This is a turn slow turn, but a turn from focusing on how do you build an argument to how do you, how will the hearers experience the sermon? In the decade or so from 1970 to 1980, homiletics builds on Davis and kicks off a homiletical revolution. Henry Mitchell writes, Black Preaching, the first scholarly homiletical work on black preaching for a wide audience, and introduces especially white homileticians to the concept of celebration. This becomes a theme in Mitchell's work that goes on. And one of the things that Mitchell shows is, yes, there are black preachers that use three-point sermons and all, but the storytelling function that goes all the way back to the African griot and all really has made black preaching different than the way homiletics has talked about preaching generally. Have I got a little echo? 
I'm going to see if that helps. Moving it down helps a little bit. Um, right about the same time, Fred Craddock writes as one without authority. This has been called the most important homiletical work of the 20th century. And I, I think it deserves that. Also, these, these books are very much still worth preaching, uh, reading. Both have been revised. Um, Fred Craddock uh, w- went to Germany and he studied with Bultmann students. Bultmann um, had said, okay, form criticism, right? But he also offered the demythologizing as an existential hermeneutic. This is how you can read these texts through an existentialist lens uh, in a scientific age. Well, his students uh, both sort of built on Bultmann and responded to him in ways and talked about reading the text as an event that you experience. Craddock takes that takes um, what he's learned from Davis and argues that we need to replace propositional preaching with sermons that offer our congregations an experience of the gospel. So notice how that's a shift from just what do you want your people to think? How do you want to persuade them? Persuasive language is moved to the side. And instead, what do you want them to experience? So Lucy Rose talks about what Craddock and others do in his line is transformational preaching. You try and transform your congregation experientially. Um, He really completes the turn to the listener that Davis began. And his proposal on how to do this is just amazingly simple. And it's in that simplicity that it's its genius. He says, we just need to quit preaching deductively and we need to start preaching inductively. So instead of starting with your conclusion, after which everyone could leave and they've already got your sermon, you start with the particulars of human experience, the particulars of the text, and you build towards a conclusion. Now, what Craddock does is often then the sermon needs to be open-ending. So you take them right up to the edge of the conclusion and don't say it and let them draw it. Because he said, everybody comes with the question, what does the scripture mean for me? So you take them on this journey from point A right before point B and you stop and they finish it. And so you take away all the shoulds and oughts and musts, what you should do, etc., and you let them draw the conclusions to that. Eugene Lowry describes Fred Craddock's preaching in this way. He says that when Fred preaches, um, he takes you into a grocery store. And you say, why in the world are we wasting sacred time going into a grocery store? We want to hear the word of God. Get us out of the grocery store, Fred. And then Fred won't leave and he takes you over to aisle three and you're looking at the canned goods. And you go, Fred, I've been looking at canned goods my whole life. I've been on this aisle hundreds, if not thousands of times. Why are you wasting my time here? And then in the midst of the mundane, the simple, he shows you something you've never seen before on aisle three. (gasps) Oh, wow. And then you want to hear what Fred's going to do with that. And you turn from aisle three back to the pulpit only to find that Fred has sat down. (laughs) So what Fred Craddock does is tease out an experience. And he assumes what you do is you go to the, the, the text you're reading. In the study, you have an experience, an aha And then you figure out how to translate that experience and offer that experience to the congregation. Preaching the Story in 1980 is a collection of essays by several scholars. And what they do is they now talk about the use of story in sermons in a different way than, say, Broadus talked about sermon illustrations. So really, starting with 70 on, we should have gotten rid of talking about sermon illustrations. That's old language that assumes that what's really important is the abstract theological talk and the stories are just add-ons. And Craddock has shifted and said, no, it's the other way around. The abstract theological language sets up the story, the stories that you're going to use to offer you an experience of the gospel. So using language of imagery instead of illustration is better, etc. Well, what these scholars do is really play 
uh, in, in different fields with how story, can, as contemporary story, can have an impact on the sermon. And they're really sort of growing out of Tillich's uh, combination of culture and tradition at this point, that method of, of correlation that he uses. Finally, uh, in 1980, comes Eugene Lowry. And what Lowry does is he takes Craddock's inductive direction of a sermon and makes it into a specific narrative form. So it says five, you know, the oops, the ug, if any of you have studied that. So it's the Lowry loop, as it's come to be called. So all sermons, he argues, should be, uh, should follow a narrative logic. That doesn't mean it should be a story sermon. Uh, it could be, but it just, it should have a narrative logic to it that so works inductively from particulars to an experience of the gospel toward a celebration. He's drawing on uh, Mitchell some at this point because the last part of the sermon is the we, right? So you, you move to um, uh, foreshadowing to a full experience. So we see what's happened here in the history of preaching from the early 20th century really uh, to the late 20th century is a real shift from persuasive um, propositional kinds of preaching to narrative preaching as a camp, a school that offers an experience of the gospel. Trying to bring narrative biblical criticism and narrative approaches to preaching together seems like a no-brainer, but actually it's not that easy. What we see in both biblical studies and homiletical studies has been a shift from Aristotle's rhetoric to his poetics, in a sense. There's a movement away from thinking in the category of persuasion to that of storytelling. From logos, uh, pathos, and ethos to plot and characterization as categories. From a narrative or a sermon um, that's building a propositional argument to how they invite experience. It seems like they're doing the same thing. Homiletics and biblical scholars have been influenced by some of the same thinking. After all, Fred Craddock was a biblical scholar who was forced to become a homiletician. Um, but there's actually a significant gap in biblical narrative criticism and narrative approaches to preaching. The two develop parallel to each other instead of narrative criticism really influencing narrative preaching. Now, that, that can be overstated. After all, these people are in the same part, in the same schools together, in the same hallways, etc. Um, but, but still, the way narrative preaching shaped was not really built on, in part because it's right at the same time as the way narrative texts were being read. That doesn't mean that preaching hasn't benefited from narrative critics. Um, preachers draw on literary insights through commentaries and articles and stuff all the time. But there are some key methodological problems that I just want to point out. First among them is this. Biblical criticism has shifted from concerns about what lies behind the text, like we said, the historical Jesus, early church author, to what lies in the text, characters, etc., before the text, the readers constructing meaning through their experiencing of the text. This involves a wide-angled lens approach to viewing the text. You must read Mark as a whole to do this. You read Luke and Acts as a single narrative. You read Matthew as a whole. So the question becomes, how does the story of Mark create certain experiences for the readers because it is a movement in time? Experience implies movement and change over time. How does the whole 16 chapters of Mark create an experience? Preaching, however, focuses on one passage at a time. We don't preach on Mark. We preach on Mark 9, 1 through 8. So the question is, how can we take a narrative reading of the whole of Mark and use it effectively in the pulpit? This leads me to want to offer a consideration of preaching beyond thinking about the individual sermon. Um, so I want to talk about cumulative preaching. Homileticians like me get tunnel vision. We spend the bulk of our time teaching introductory preaching courses. Now think how much psychological damage that does to a person. <laughs> 
we get all these brand new preachers in or preachers who've been preaching for eight years and think they have everything and don't need anything from us. Semester after semester after semester, we teach new generations of students the basics of how to put together a sermon. How to interpret a text for a sermon. How to develop a, um, a message, a theme from the sermon. How to structure it. How to fill it in with imagery, etc. How to embody the message. No wonder so much homiletical literature has been spit on the individual sermon and what the sermon does. Well, you got to remember, there's only so much a professor can do in a single semester. I tell my students who come into an intro preaching class that they should think of it as beginning to learn a new musical instrument. And by the end of the semester, what they will know is how to hold the instrument. <laughs> Maybe get some sound out of it. They will not have accomplished this instrument. They were certainly not to the level of jazz improvisation on this. They won't be a master violinist. That comes not in an elective. I wish that would give that. With an elective, we might get to scales. That comes after years of practicing in the pulpit on real life people out there. <laughs> Preaching week after week after week. Those of you who preach regularly know the shortcomings of focusing on the individual sermon because you preach week after week after week. You know that while we all have the occasional sermon that really sings, that really, really impacts your congregation, that really changes a life, that really invokes God's spirit, you know that while that happens occasionally, the real power of the pulpit comes from preaching to the same people week after week after week and praying as hard as you can that our mediocre sermons have an effect Amen. on those people. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but when I was in the pastorate, I used to complain that my people sat in the same place every week. <laughs> I hear I have some sisters and brothers here. I'm glad to know. But in truth... Our congregation sitting in the same place is a gift to the preacher. Every Sunday, Marie and the kids sit in the same pew over there. Every Sunday, Marcus and Stephen enter a little late and sit in the back on the right. You know just by glancing up from the pulpit that Todd or Marilyn or Amber are missing this Sunday. You know who's there, you know who isn't. Uh, one of my D-Men students used to tell that he would, on Wednesday, when he got stuck in the middle of sermon preparation, he could go into the empty sanctuary and he would sit in places and say, okay, Larry sits here. What does Larry need from this text this week? He would move around, he would go up into the balcony where the youth sit and said, what in the world might catch their attention this week? While they just sit over us like vultures waiting for the rest to die. <laughs> Preaching to the same people week after week after week, working through a narrative text in the way that it unfolds would seem to imply a simple series where you structure part one, part two, part three, etc. So that that's the way we can build on it. But there's a problem. Regular attendance in church ain't what it used to be. <laughs> This chart is based on some data from the Pew Research Center, and it shows the distribution of people who claim to be mainline Protestants. So they've, they've named themselves in this way. About a third attend at least weekly. Le a little less than half attend somewhere between once or twice a month to a few times a year. A quarter, a quarter of the people who say, I'm a Methodist, or I'm a Presbyterian, or I'm UCC, or whatever, attend rarely to never. So how is one to preach cumulatively in this kind of ecclesial world? How do you help the weekly attendees appreciate the bigger picture of Christian theology and tradition than a single sermon can address without leaving in the dust those who show up occasionally occasionally? 
and those who pop in almost never. How do you preach to both of these kinds of groups? Those who are there every Sunday faithfully, unless they're sick, and even then some of those try and get there when they shouldn't, and those who just are there every once in a while. So I've argued that preachers need to start thinking themselves analogously to script writers for weekly TV shows. Now think about the way these script writers have to think about their audience. You want to write a show that would invite a newcomer in. So you're in season three of Friends, and you're always trying to expand your audience. So you need to show that if somebody's flipping the channels the way I do, Jerry Seinfeld once said, men don't care what's on TV, they care what else is on TV. Um, if you're flipping around, you want somebody to land on your show and go, hmm, I'll give this a try. And even though the show's been going on for two and a half years, they can still watch it and get a full experience out of it. Uh, as the, the plot unfolds, as the humor of the friends, you know, whatever it does. So you can watch it. But you also want character development, uh, plot development over time, that those people who are um, seasoned watchers will get more out of it. And it'll keep them coming back. So somebody who comes in fresh can watch it from the beginning. Someone who comes in again and again and again knows whether or not Ross and Rachel are on or off. That kind of thing. I think we need to preach in that same kind of way. We need to preach thinking about, uh, if we're preaching from Mark over time, how can we write this sermon so that a, new, that a seeker, somebody who shows up in the church for the first time or someone who hasn't been here in months can, can get an experience of the gospel fully, but those who've been coming regularly get additional things to it, a, a deeper understanding of the text. Um, repeated language that keeps me seeing the broader context of the passage. Now, I want to complicate it a little bit by saying we need to be honest that people who attend weekly don't necessarily remember last week's sermon. <laughs> they may not remember the sermon past lunch. Um, so cumulative preaching needs to not sort of say, okay, part one, part two, because you assume people are and all. You need to think of it in more nuanced ways. So I'm going to shift metaphors and think about preaching as a vocabulary lesson. When I was in high school, we had four years of the same vocabulary books. These weren't them. I couldn't, I looked for them online. Couldn't find mine, but you get the idea. Four sets. And I can remember those books with the swish of color across the front. It was a different color each year, but the, the pattern was exactly the same. On Monday, we would be introduced to the words and their definitions. On Tuesday, we would match words to definitions. On Wednesday, we'd write a paragraph, each using the word correctly. Uh, uh, I mean, write a sentence using each word correctly. On Thursday, we'd do a paragraph using all ten words. And on Friday, we'd have a quiz. Four years I did that pattern. I remember learning one word. <laughs> Edifice. <laughs> in case you didn't know it's a building I don't know why I remember learning that now that does not mean I only learned one word I only remember learning one word I wouldn't be as eloquent as I am today had I not learned a lot more I think preaching works that way if we seek to have our sermons remembered, that's more of an ego issue than it is about the effectiveness of the gospel. Our goal is to have the gospel assimilated the same way we assimilate vocabulary over time. So we got to preach with repetition and all in ways that get us much deeper. So one of the ways to think about it, because I'm going to switch metaphors yet one more time, um, is that when we preach, we focus in on a specific text, but as part of the sermon, we need to give the wider context so you can see that passage in a little bit better. So you need to think about a wide angle and a zoom lens uh, working together in every sermon uh, um, cumulatively. So a few just pieces of advice then about Mark specifically. I can get away here with using a definition of a parable like this. You can't get away with that in a sermon. At that point, everybody's changed channels. 
But that doesn't mean you can't talk about every parable as being twisty. You know, use the same language. And you talk about, you know, Mark is a parable. Parables are twisty, right? So you just look for ways that sort of duplicate those things and keep bringing it back together. To talk about Mark as a parable is going to be a challenge to some of your hearers. Uh, They want to hear it the way I was taught. It's a journalistic historical piece. So how do you get them into it? So I used to, in the pulpit, I still use it with students now, use the language from Paul Tillich of the Gospels as different expressionistic paintings. They, an expressionist or impressionist painter doesn't try and offer a realistic view of whatever. They instead have an experience of what they're going to paint. And they try to convey that experience to their viewers, to, to those, their audience. So here we have four paintings, all with a still life of fruit, but they offer very different experiences looking at them. The four Gospels work that way. You tell that over and over again, you get away from the journalistic approach, and people can say, oh, okay, what's Mark's expressionistic kind of thing? So all this takes repetition. Um, well, what's especially twisting for Mark, of course, is his Christology and his portrayal of the disciples. For a parable to work and to surprise a congregation, it has to have a twist. For it to have a twist, it's got to have that uh, familiar element to start off with. So reminding congregations regularly that the Gospels were written more for communities of faith than as evangelical tools will help invite them in to hear it at a different level. Then you can highlight in specific passages elements that should be strange to those who already knew the story. Reminding a congregation over and over again that Mark was written to deal with a theological crisis, the fall of the temple. Just You, you can't assume they know this stuff. Now I would say that anytime you're going to preach on a, a text cumulatively, you also could run a Bible study outside of class, puts things in the newsletter and social media, but you want to create the dynamic of the twist in a contemporary settings way, but you just want to keep repeating these things. Anytime a text comes up with a Christological term in it, you should pause over it and put it in relation to son of God, son of the human language, which is central for Mark. So again, just quickly go to the wide angle lens and then come back into your text. You want to use the same language over and over and over again. I'll give you examples of why I think that's powerful. Uh, Two, when I was at this one church, um, I mentioned this to somebody yesterday, I had a group of women who went to every funeral I ever did. I think they did it for every pastor who was there. They really thought it was part of their pastoral ministry to the community. So they were always there, whether they were close to the person or not. They always sat together um, at the back and all. Well, you know what it's like to have to write a funeral sermon, right? You've got to have some basic stock language you've got in place because you've got to preach it tomorrow. You can't write a beginning to end sermon every time. And so that language became part of the dialogue we would have in church outside of funerals. So my theology of eternal life and resurrection and all became conversation points, whether everybody agreed with it or not. Another example is I remember preaching on the story of Nicodemus. Text is coming up. And um, I, I said that, you know, Nicodemus just didn't get it. He was taking the language literally and it needed to be offered, you know, it was figuratively. And it was like Jesus went over and tapped him on the forehead and said, metaphor, metaphor. Well, a couple of Sundays later, I started talking about a metaphor in a text. And a teenager went. (laughs) So the preacher went. And everybody in the congregation went. And it became a thing. And so every time I could, I would talk about metaphor. And people reached up. So don't feel like you're being redundant. You're reinforcing the assimilation of the vocabulary of the faith by using these kinds of terms. Um, You want to focus on the disciples as much as you can when you preach through Mark and their confusion, but you need to always make sure your critique of them is empathetic because you're asking your congregation to identify with them. So over and over again, you want to say, they're confused. But aren't we all, you know, use the same kind of language to consistently show that empathetic thing. Anytime the messianic secret shows up, 
You should take a minute to refer to it, whether or not it's central to your sermon or not. Just keep saying, this is key to the way Mark does the whole unfolding. Um, I want to end by mentioning that um, people who say politics should have no place in religion and your sermons haven't read the Bible. Um, As you know, the Bible's thoroughly uh, filled with politics. We just miss it because we've domesticated the Bible. But every time you preach on Mark and you draw on the language of the Son of God or the reign of God, we've seen that that's over against the reign of Caesar and Caesar as Son of God. So speaking of God's reign was shorthand for naming God's will for the world the way it ought to be instead of the way it is. So I I think you need to repeatedly bring this up without being in your face. And I think there are two common mistakes preachers make when they read the Bible politically. First of all, they um, often assume that the ancient uh, biblical political stances um, mesh with a contemporary political stance with which I align myself. Right. So the Bible's politics are my politics. The rest of you need to get in line. Um, But remember, in the ancient world, not all Caesars were equal. Some were more vicious. Some cared more about justice. Um, Some were Republican Caesars and some were Democratic Caesars. But they were all emperors who asserted their power through violence. They all, to some degree or another, protected the status quo that benefited them and their class. What can be named in passing over and over again in preaching... Uh, Mark's politics is not that Jesus was apolitical, but instead that he chose the route of powerlessness to reveal God's claim on the world and to um, unveil the true lack of power Caesar has. So to bring that into play. The second common mistake preachers make when highlighting the political aspects of Mark and other biblical writers is that they leave out the eschatological aspect of biblical politics of New Testament politics especially. Some 2,000 years after Jesus didn't return, we mainliners have just sort of pretend that eschatology is not there. Sure, if we mention Revelation, everybody in the church gets really interested. That's so odd. But they don't see it everywhere else. It's important to recognize that the world is that's pictured in Mark and lots of parts of the Bible is this very dualistic battleground where God and evil struggle against each other. Powers and principalities line up on one side or the other. Humans join the battle on one side or the other. At some point, God will be victorious and it will be the end of the world as we know it. This doesn't necessarily mean destruction of existence, although some of the imagery seems to imply that. Instead, it means that the reign of God will institute something so radically different from all that has gone before it that it's hard to speak of it in any way without the metaphor of the end. Now, I think there's good reason for us to not take biblical eschatology literally in our contemporary worldview, but that doesn't mean we are excused from using eschatology and and bringing it out. It helps to recognize that ancient Christians understood eschatology in different ways. Um, I love this quote that my pastor, Kerry Smith, introduced me to from Augustine. Hope has two beautiful daughters. Their names are anger and courage, anger at the way the way things are and courage to see things, uh, see that they do not remain as they are. That's the already not yet language of eschatology. We have already experienced something (coughs) of the um, the salvation of God. We wouldn't be here had we not. But we look at the world and we see it is still filled with suffering and pain. And God's full will for the world has not yet become manifest. So what are we going to do with that already not yet? Well, one way to get past the literal reading of it is to recognize that Mark seems to himself to question a literal reading of this. When he says twice, people of this generation will not pass away before this occurs. Well, everybody in Mark's day knew... People had passed away. 
So I don't mean to imply that Mark didn't take a chronological, literal view of eschatology, but he also seemed to layer it, at the very least, with some kind of experiential view. So when I preach and try and interpret eschatology experientially, I use the same metaphor over and over and over again with congregations. I talk about the experience of driving down a country road in the middle of night. The middle of the night, there's no street lights, you're out there, so what do you do? You turn on your headlights uh, to high beam, you shift a little towards the middle of the road so you don't go off the edge, and you're just driving good, fine. And then you start going up a hill, and on the other side of the hill, you see lights coming over. So what do you do at that moment? Low beams, and shift back, make sure you're in the lane. That moment, I think, is biblical eschatology. That moment when you've already experienced the headlights, car, but not yet the fullness of the car, and yet you have adjusted your behavior in life to match it when it comes. I think that's not a bad, and you can find your own, but you're welcome to use this one, um, because I'm always right. Um, <laughs> you know, but, but to help people see that that language has meaning in different ways, and then you go from that metaphorical kind of understanding to it to what does it mean about this particular eschatological kind of concern. I think we're at our time, um, so we need to wrap up. We, we've, we've got a time for a little break, and then we're coming back together for our workshop, and we'll do some Q&A there, and we're going to talk about uh, Q, this form of cumulative preaching in relation to lectionary and sermon series. Thank you very much. Thank you.